Kato Kato. I'm Elizabeth Kerr and I have with me today composers Ariana Tikau and Phil Brownlee who have just been working on a new collaborative work called Manaki and it's to be premiered uh, in a concert called Hine Puta Hue in the Aotearoa New Zealand Festival of the Arts. Phil's a composer and a sound artist Ariana is a composer, a singer, and a specialist performer on Tangaporo Māori traditional instruments. Kia ora, korua. Kia ora. Kia ora. Can we start with the name of your new work? Can you tell us about the concept of manaki within Tao Māori and why you've chosen this name for the piece you've created together? Ariana. Kia ora. Um, so, yeah, manaki can mean um, hospitality or looking after your guests or your manuhiri to make them feel welcome mm -hmm. um, and it's a key concept within the porphyry process uh, and yeah, we came up with the idea of writing the piece around uh, the, the porphyry basically in terms of the, the various stages um, you know, that occurs during the ritual of encounter um, but yeah, manaki is kind of a, a key concept within um, within Te Ao Māori I think as well and I think a lot of people can um, can learn um, from that concept of, of understanding you know all, all people do it as well in terms of um, you know when um, when as humans you know that that we want to look after the people in our care um, so yeah I think it was just a really lovely um, idea to explore sonically and, um, uh, and I think also conceptually. It in, so it includes the word mana mm, uh, that's within right. it so it's I've heard it described as lifting the mana of others as well as your yeah, own. I, I think that that is also yeah um, that the the mana of the manuhiri or the guests are, um, is uplifted but also your um, in terms of the, from the mana whenua side, um, you're also uplifting the mana or withholding, um, not withholding, um, upholding the mana of your marae as well, mm. if you're uh, welcoming people on. Mm -hmm. So you've mentioned the work is structured around the pōhiri process. There are different sections with different concepts within that. Um, can you mm. explain perhaps how those work in the structuring of the work? Yes, yeah, so the the the, the pulpity process goes through a number of of phases with different meanings, and we've reflected that in the used that as a, as a shape to structure the mm -hmm. the musical development. Uh, partly also, then it's uh, different Tongapoto instruments are used for each of the different sections. Mm -hmm. So it begins with a uh, purerehua, which is kind of preparing the ground, of opening the space for what's, what's to follow. And then the, uh, the, the poetry opens with the, the call of the karanga, which begins with, with the violins, the, which we're treating as, as the female voices in the quartet. Mm -hmm. And then the Tangapura player respond, calls back to that in response. And that's followed by a tangi section, which is remembering and honouring the ancestors, the tipuna. Yeah, there's, um, within the, the process after that initial karanga, there's um, a special type of karanga which is calling upon the ancestors to be present um, in, within the, the ceremony. And so, yeah, the, the sounds um, that we're trying to um, incorporate are the, the tangi mm -hmm. sound, and um, there's a concept of hotu hotu, which is kind of that, that kind of cry on your chest that that uh, wavering sound, so that's um, particularly present um, within the, the sound of the putorino sound, um, but the, the strings um, are also backing that up, mm. aren't they? Um, so I think that's quite an important part of the, the whole piece, is to kind of get the, the feeling of that, of bringing on the, the ancestors, but also remembering those who have passed on, so it's kind of... Um, yeah, apt I think for now. Like we have both worked with Richard Nuns, um, mm. who we'll probably talk about a little bit more later. And um, you know, Richard just passed away not so long ago. So 
it's um, in some ways a, a time to remember Richard and his influence on on us um, within this world. Um, and then yeah, we move on into the other section of the Whaikore Rō. Um, would you like to Yes, so that passes then to the, the male voice of the Putorino, which is, and, and combined with a, a solo on the, the cello and the string quartet. So the, the oratory of the Fire Cordero is an exchange of ideas and a, a discussion of of why we're here and what we're doing here. Quite an energetic commentary often, yes. isn't it? But always male. Is that uh, right? Not always. No, <laughs> not depending always. on what tea we are. Depends where you are. Ah, right, mm. okay. Yeah. But mostly, yeah. mostly yeah, male. So, yeah, mostly. so we're mostly exploring those male voices, I guess, and the, the cello sort of really comes in at that point as well. Yeah. yeah. So you've talked about the Puterino having a female voice and a male voice. How does that work? Um, so yeah, there are lots of different techniques and voices within the Puterino. Um, so the male voice is kind of more like the trumpet sounding mm. one, mm -hmm. um, played in a similar way of um, the putatara um, at the, the top end of the instrument. And then um, the female voice is, is played more like a kōwowo mm -hmm. of the uh, Cross blowing mm -hmm. technique, and then there's another central mangai, which is the the hole in the middle of the instrument. Um, that is, um, it can represent both elements, but also sometimes it's um, said to represent the the next generation, the the babies of the the two. So um, that technique is is also used within um, the piece itself. So yeah, the putorino has got so many mm. different ways that you can express and play, so it's a great instrument to, mm. to use within this. And it's interesting that, you, I mean, what you're describing is a very multi-layered way of constructing something because there's a concept and then there's the instrument which embodies those concepts but also has other, embodies other things as well, so it's, it's, um, it's fascinating. Mm. So this is not the first time you two have collaborated on the creation of a composition. Um, the first one I think was 2015, um, Kota Tatai Fetu, and that was um, commissioned by the Christchurch Symphony Orchestra as a concerto for Tangapuro and orchestra, and you were the soloist on the Tangapuro. And then later it was arranged for chamber ensemble and played again by Stroma. Um, so this new work, is this the second time, that, or have there been other collaborations? There have been adaptations, various versions of, of Kōte Tātai Fetu, and it's kind of gone on growing since the first performance. Uh, so this is, this, yeah, this is a, the second separate entity. Uh, we've, been, mm. we've been talking about working together further and you know, what, we'd, what we could do next. So it's, it's, we're really pleased to, to have the opportunity to to present a new piece and to work to work together again. So why do you choose to work together in this way? What is it about it's collaborative? I think initially it was Richard really that brought us together. Um, Richard, Richard Nunn's. Richard mm -hmm. Nunn's, he was going to write the piece with you, wasn't he? Yes, he yeah, well, it, it began really? it began as a piece for Richard with the, with the Christchurch Symphony Orchestra, and during that process, Richard kind of Richard brought us Richard brought Ariana into the process and. Kind of, mm. just kind of nudged us together and said, "Oh, you two, you two might get on." And 
Yeah, mm-hmm. very, very grateful for that. Yes, uh, and he was still well enough to be able to mentor us through the process as well. So uh, yes, we had we had some uh, lovely while ago with him yeah. and Nelson while we were working together. Mm. So, Manaki Tanga is kind of about dialogue and respect, isn't it? And um, is that how you work together? How do you work together? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. It was interesting because we had quite a lot of time, didn't we, to yeah. work on that or- original piece, Kote Tātai Whetu, and um, a big part of that, um, the initial stages of that was actually just getting to know each other, and um, then the kaupapa came out of that, um, out of discussions, and I suppose I was playing um, my taonga to, um, to Phil, and yeah, you were recording how I played my tongue and and then um, yeah a lot of talking and a lot of listening and I mean listening to what each other had done before but then also playing together and we were uh, improvising together on tongue or on piano and just finding things that fitted and and then a lot of back and forth I'm preparing you know, sending sending sketches of what, what 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 I was writing to the orchestra back to Ariana and Finding out what fitted and what did out. A lot of the process in terms of the orchestral music was was taking things out. Actually, it was mm. throwing things away, uh, yes. make, make just leading space for mm. for the instruments. For and Ariana, also for the, for yeah, the writing tanga. the motia um, kind of the rangi for the motia mm. which was um, it's a traditional motia from Kaitahu, mm. which is my iwi, mm. and um, yeah, it was also something that fitted the the time of the year that we were presenting the piece in June, so it coincided with the Matariki mm. season and um, this piece was all about um, the stars and uh, constellations and um, kind of that cordero around um, our puraka associated with how the sky was adorned with stars. So yeah, so that became the centrepiece I suppose of um, from which yeah, Phil was able to write the orchestral parts and, and I came up with the, the rangi for the waiata for the sung component as well as the tongue for all. I really enjoy having another another creative person to to work with to bounce off. You know, I think I think we both end up in places that we wouldn't have found on our own. Mm. Yeah. And so, have you had to learn about Tangaporo in in this way? Have you played them as part of this process? I haven't yet. I'm starting to feel them calling to me. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, it's it's been. It's been a very long process. I first first heard Tangaporo in the early '90s, I think, when when Richard came to the Nelson Composers Workshop mm. and played for us and talked to us, and I mean, that made a very strong impression. And, and at the time, I was sort of, I'm in love with these sounds, but I can't see a way to fit them into my own practice. Mm. And got to yeah, you know, I got to know Richard there and sort of caught up with him every time he was in came through Wellington after that and sort of watched him playing with many different people and in many different contexts and kind of worked my way towards the point where well it was, it was a real honour that it, 
after a while, Richard, Richard and Bridget Douglas approached me and said, "Would you like to make a piece with us?" And that was so I kind of had to had to work out how to how to deal with it in the context of my own mm. my own music. Mm. Um, and yeah, very grateful for that. Yes, wonderful opportunity. And so I'm I'm always yeah, every 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 step is is all the uh, I'm always learning as I work in this space. Yeah. And so, Ariana, do you have to think when you're composing this piece with Phil for string quartet and Tawamapuru, have you had to learn how a string quartet works? Or <laughs> had to think about that quite hard in terms of your own creative work? I think mostly um, thinking about the different frequencies and voices, I suppose. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, we, we often think of voices in terms of the Tonga that they're, they're like um, people and singing in, in a way um, and all of the I also think of that the atua associated with different instruments and so um, I haven't really thought about that in terms of the string quartet entity but um, definitely the the frequencies and um, the different um, sounds I suppose and um, the feeling that they yeah um, yeah mm. they evoke mm. Exactly 20 years ago, Dame Gillian Whitehead, working with Richard Nunns, composed a work for String Quartet and Tangapura called Hine Puta Hue, which had its premiere in this very festival. It was the first work for such a quintet and it was going to be performed alongside your new work in this concert. Dame Gillian, Gillian tells me it was quite an experimental piece 20 years ago and that she wanted to create a sound world that related to pre-European sounds, a pre-European world rather than a contemporary world, um, a sound world that suggested natural sounds, wind and distant forest sounds, and Hine Puta Hue was the goddess of peace and her attribute was the gourd, used to hold and carry food and water, and many of the tangaporo that she used in the piece uh, were traditionally made from gourds. So this was a piece 20 years ago, she was composing it around the time of 9-11 and with a theme of peace, but a fragile kind of peace um, in the forest, listening for danger in the far distance. Phil, was, that, was the significance of that piece um, important to you when you two began your mahi on Manaki? Yes, I think so. Uh, and in particular, Gillian really led the way for approaches to combining notated composed music with Tongapora. I, I remember being very excited about that concert because mm. it was it, it, it was so new and no one quite knew how it was going to work and it worked so amazingly well. Mm. Um, it's a very I have vivid memories of the performance. Mm -hmm. I think thematically we're thematically we're in a similar in a similar kind of space and different causes, but possibly I mean, things are things are no more settled today than they were than they were 20 years ago for different reasons. Mm. So it's still those that kind of those kind of ideas still feel very relevant and very necessary. Yeah, absolutely. And so now. Rehearsals are about to begin, and the premiere is imminent. What are you thinking about the work now? How's it feeling? Um, yeah, we had a chance just recently to record me playing some Tonga Poro as a guide track, and I felt really good about that to be able to um, overlay um, my playing into 
a rehearsal um, that the uh, string quartet had had recorded um, not so long ago, a few weeks ago. Yeah, that was the first time that we'd really heard them mm. all of the the different sounds together. So that was quite exciting, and um, I'm really looking forward to hearing how Horomona interprets it as well, mm. um, and what he can bring kind of as a, a male and a uh, speaker of Rio as well, and um, he's quite dramatic in his performance style as well, so it's going to be really interesting to, to see um, how he performs it with the uh, quartet. Yes, because there's a strong interface, interaction between what he's doing and what the quartet is doing, you know, that he's responding mm. to their sounds and... Yes, and yeah. he's... Oh, it's the, the nature of Tonga Porter performance, so he's never going to do the same thing twice, so it's going to be really interesting running the rehearsal process and seeing how it grows and what it, what mm. it turns into. Yeah, I think at times he'll be leading different sections as well and they'll be responding, so mm. just to have um, the spaces and the that live interaction is going to be really interesting yes. and I'm quite looking forward to just um, you know being able to sit back and uh, watch someone else perform it, um, mm -hmm. so yeah, rather than be having to perform it myself. Yes, and so as a composer, you, his work is not notated, You're, you've created spaces in the work and he then responds to those. So it's not, mm -hmm. not a completely free improvisation, but, it, but within that it's improvisatory. And probably, as you say, each performance is going to be different. Mm -hmm. I mean, he has, he has the context of the, the co part of the piece, about, of yes. what it's about and what he's, he and we are trying to communicate. And then he's, yes, he's, within that framework, he's improvising in response to the, the music that the quartet are playing. Mm -hmm. And I hope also the quartet, uh, we've designed it in such a way that the quartet have the freedom to respond to him as well, so mm -hmm. the, the whole thing is, is meant to be quite flexible. Mm -hmm. So it's a very fascinating approach to, to creating a new work, isn't it? Mm. And it was supposed to have its premiere at the Adam Chamber Music Festival in Nelson and sadly that festival couldn't take place this year, but it will hopefully take place in 2023. Will your work be there? I hope so. Um, mm. Conversations with Helena and with the quartet, I think they would, they would like to do it in Nelson. Mm. Um, we'll see. And um, your Bob Bickerton was going to be playing the Tonga Port of Hearts um, at, at that festival and so yeah, we're hoping that he'll still be able to Did get a chance to play it as well. This, yeah. He was part of the rehearsal yes. process and even made some special Tonga that fit, fitted with the, um, the different um, you know, notes or you know, pictures. So. And he was another protege mm. of Matua Richard. So mm. again, carrying and has some of those instruments. So again, mm. taking all of that forward. Yes. Yeah. Well, I wish you well with the premiere. I hope it's a wonderful success. I'm really looking Thank forward you. to it. Thank you. Thank you.